Good morning, everybody. Very welcome to Aroville. We are here in Nidan Guest House of Certitude. I am Luca, old time Arovillian and uh, matrimony coordinator, another role in the community of Auroville. This is Amrit, much older Arovillian than me. He has been here from the beginning. He has dedicated all his life in uh, spiritual activity and spiritual work. And uh, this is the second session that we are doing uh, over the integral yoga of Sirobindo, a traditional path. So we would like to deepen up uh, the subject. Last time we arrived, summarizing that, we arrived to uh, explain that the Sirobindo yoga, supramental yoga, has been anyway composed by the heart Krishna realization and so the Brahma realization to lead later or what we call it a supramental realization. Now, what we would like to ally today, and Amrit will be the one able to do so, to see the connection between the traditional yoga, all these sing all singular paths that led to the creation of the integral yoga of Siorobindo. So now I would like very much to let the speech to Amrit, that he will explain the relation between tradition and the modern integral yoga of Siorobindo Purna Yoga. So Amrit, could you expand a bit more <laughs> what you uh, so told us on the first session. Uh, okay. Now, it's very clear if one examines uh, Sri Bindo's own history of spiritual realizations that the, particularly the first two initial realizations of Sri Bindo in 1908 uh, in 1908, his first realization, which he achieved within three days, was the reali realization of the Supreme Brahman. It, it was a pure Advaitin uh, realization. Advaita is uh, a form of a spiritual uh, endeavor in India where you find what is real and what is unreal. And in the Advaita, there are three propositions. The first is that the only reality is the Supreme Brahman and the Supreme Self. The second proposition is that all else is Maya. It is illusion. It is not real. Basically, this is based on the perception that what is permanent is real and what is impermanent is unreal because it passes and dies. So, in the Advaita, this these two propositions are what Sri Aurobindo realized in his first experience. He realized the Supreme Brahman as the true reality and all else as unreal. Now, there is a third proposition of Advaita. The first, again to repeat, is the only reality is the Supreme Brahman, the Supreme Self. The second is, all else is unreal, it is Maya. But the third one is that all is the Supreme Brahman, including that which is unreal. These all are part of the Brahman consciousness. So it is this that Sri Aurobindo realized in the second experience. While he was in the same year, in 1908, he was in the Alipur jail. And in the jail, he had the realization of Vasudeva or Krishna, which is the indwelling deity within the heart of all beings. So he saw Vasudeva as the reality in everything, in material things, in the earth, 
in all beings, in human beings, in animals, in everything. So it is this that is the third proposition of the Advaita, that all, including that which is unreal according to the first two propositions, all of this is a manifestation of the Supreme Brahma. Now, Sri Binda realized this. He saw Vasudeva, the Divine, in everything. He saw it, he saw this uh, Divine in the other prisoners. He saw it in the cell that he was jailed in. He saw it in the judge. He saw it in the lawyers. He saw it in all beings and everything. Everything he saw was only Vasudeva. Sri Krishna. These two realizations of Sri Bindu, that of the first two propositions of Advaita, that is, he saw the, that the only reality was the Supreme Brahman, all else is unreal, and yet everything is a manifestation of that Brahman. These seem contradictory, but they're not. So these two realizations led to Sri Bindo's yoga, integral yoga of the three transformations. Now, what are the two transformations? The first transformation is the psychic transformation. Now, this is also a part of Advaita, and it is also part of the traditional yogas. So, like the great proponent, proponent of Advaita was Ramana Maharishi of Tiruvannamalai. He said that the Supreme Brahman is seated in the heart as yourself. And it is, part, it is basically the same as the Supreme Brahman that is in all things. And it's so, basically what the tradition called the soul, what in yeah. Christianity we know as the soul in our heart. Okay, but there is a slight difference between the, uh, how to say, the way that Ramana proposed and the way that Sri Bindu both emphasized yes. the soul, but there were slightly two different aspects. In Ramana's way, it is what is most important is this uh, reality of this immutable, eternal, unchanging aspect Untouched. of the self, of the Brahman. And this is seated in the heart also. So that which is seated in the heart, according to Ramana, is the unchanging self. But in Sri Bindo's yoga, it is the other aspect. You see, it's like two sides of the same coin. And this corresponds to the two forms of Advaita. Ramana pro was the proponent of absolute non-dualistic Advaita, which emphasized this, this reality, unchanging reality behind everything. Sri Bindo, he realized this, but he also took another side of it. You see, there are two forms of Advaita. There is the absolute non-dualistic Advaita, which emphasizes the unchanging, permanent, eternal reality of the Self. But the second form of the Advaita is called Tantric Advaita. In the Tantric Advaita, they take the other side of the soul, which is the side of the Shakti. This side is very much connected with the earth, with the manifestation, and it evolves. 
Whereas in so Ramana's Shakti is a Sanskrit term for energy or yeah. feminine aspect of the divine. For those that are yes. not acquainted with this the vocabulary. The energy aspect of the divine, of the Brahman, is in fact the evolutionary aspect. It is the aspect that is connected with the earth, with all living beings, with the creation. In fact, without that aspect of the divine, there is no creation. So, basically, what the Tantric Advaita says is that this aspect of the energy, of the, of the creative energy of the divine, is part of the Supreme Brahman. It is also part of this immutable self. So, when you talk about the realization of the soul in the heart, there actually it's a dual aspect. You have that aspect that is immutable, that doesn't change. And this is what Ramana emphasized. But you also have a part of the soul that evolves through different lives. This is the secret of reincarnation and of the different lives that people take Reincarnation is not that we are reborn in our old personalities. It is the soul that takes birth in a human body, and each time it takes birth, it evolves, it changes, it grows like a baby. Very important. Mm. First, it is like a spark, and then slowly this spark grows into a baby, and then it evolves, it grows as we grow, and it becomes fully formed. This process of evolution is in fact the secret of creation, why there is creation, and why ultimately this process of evolution will lead to what Sri Aurobindo calls the third transformation the supermental transformation. And In maybe worth maybe worth it to mention that so far on religion level, this this evolution of the soul is subject to the principle of karma, to the karmic principle on the level of the religion. Before to arrive to the yogi where this kind of principle gets somehow purified and the soul is able to evolve through the realization of to the final realization of what they call liberation on the level of religion. But we are talking about yoga. So the, yeah, the no. kar karmic mm. principle is another element of this whole evolutive uh, play of the soul. In fact, this is precisely why people do yoga. Why it is necessary to come into inner contact with that soul because it aids in the evolution of that soul. Now, this is a very complex thing which is very difficult to understand. I think most of us cannot really understand why it is like that. But the fact is, the only part of a human being that is free from karma is actually the soul. That even that evolving entity, it becomes in re but this is in relation to the manifestation. In relation to the reality, it is always permanent. It is always unchanging. But in the part that faces towards creation, it takes these experiences of creation mm -hmm. and it evolves like a child evolves upon the earth. But this evolution is a free evolution. It's not like, like say for example, when we live in our bodies upon the earth, we are subject to karma. We are subject to, like say, we make a lot of mistakes. We create more karma. This is why, according to the Buddha, we have on earth the three sufferings, 
that afflict human beings. One is disease, the other is old age, and the other is death. These three things are because we are born in a world to karma. What Sri Aurobindo is aiming at is a different way of procreation because this karma is propagated through sexual uh, rebirth, where sexual uh, uh, means of taking birth. So, in order to free ourselves from this karma, there has to be a new way of reproduction. Now, this is what Sri Aurobindo developed, uh, was aiming at through his integral yoga and the three transformations. But without the traditional yogas, the realizations of the traditional yogas, that is, the first is the psyche, the realization of your own soul. The second is the spiritual realization, the realization of the, of the universal self, the universal and transcendent self of the Supreme Brahman. These two realizations are the basis for his third transformation, which is the supramental transformation. In other words, without these two basic transformations, you cannot do the third, it's impossible. So this is why the realizations of the traditional yogas in India are very much the basis of Sri Aurobindo's yoga of the Triple Transformation. And there are definitely uh, he, is, he has uh, evolved a certain process for this also, which he de uh, dis describes in the Synthesis of Yoga, and he also describes in the small book, particularly of the Mother. And what he has done, he has taken the essence of many of the traditional yogas, and he has uh, formulated certain principles, what he calls aspiration, rejection, and surrender. Now, this is the heart, basically, of his yoga. And, and these uh, triple principles of aspiration, rejection, and surrender, he has invoked the Shakti, because it is through the Shakti that these three uh, principles are the opening through which you can offer yourself to the Shakti and it, because, you know, by our own efforts, it is very difficult to achieve what he wanted. It has to be by a grace and this grace is affected by two things. One, by the power of the Shakti and two, by your effort of this triple which we call the triple efforts. So, combining the effort from your side and the, and the grace of this Supreme Shakti which can lift you up, this is the essential practice in Sri Aurobindo's Yoga. But he also says very clearly, the main thing first, by whatever means, is to attain the spiritual consciousness of the first two transformations. The psychic, which is the most important in the very beginning, and the spiritual. Psychic here, the spiritual here. And these, you know... Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Now, you know, even his yoga of the, the triple efforts, aspiration, rejection, surrender, there are many people 
when they first come to yoga, they don't understand. It's very difficult to understand because, you know, it's very uh, in the in the traditional Indian yogas. They say there are three levels of practice. The first is called anava upaya. This means physical practices like doing puja, doing japa. External worship. Yeah, very, very concrete ways to meditate. And the second way is called shaktopaya, which are practices that are more subtle. Like Sri Bindu's way is a shaktopaya practice. Just as Ramana Maharishi's practice of who am I, that is a shaktopaya practice because it already presupposes a certain level of spiritual maturity. Self-inquiry practice yeah. that is suggested Shakta by Ramana. Shaktopaya practices Pro already Pro require a certain understanding. So this is why, for most people, it's advisable to follow more concrete practices like puja, japa. Even in the ashram, where, where, they, where the main yoga is the yoga mother and Sri Bindu, people do, the, they go to the samadhi, they touch the samadhi, they pray, you and off, this, offer flower and this is, a, in fact, anavopaya practice. They circle the samadhi. These are all anavopaya practices because they're very concrete. And it's also very important. It's very important. People think that because it is physical, it is lower. This is not true. Mother was quite clear about this. She said, for complete realization, you have to have a realization from the very physical up to the highest and all the levels in between. You cannot neglect anything. And she listed what it was. She said the physical, it is a need of the physical to worship concretely, to touch the feet of your guru, to circumambulate, to repeat the name of your whatever, the divine. So these are all physical practices that are necessary for the human being to express it himself physically. Then she said, the other level is the vital level, which is the occult level. It's all the levels in between the physical and the mental. And she said, these occult levels are also necessary. You have to have a knowledge of this. And the third, was the mental level of what she called spiritual compre uh, mental comprehension of the spiritual principles that that are the basis of your spiritual efforts she said this is the level of spiritual philosophy then the highest level is the spirit level of spiritual experience so she said all of these levels are necessary for a full realization of the yoga. Now, this is very much a part of the tantric Advaita. It's not so much a part of the non-dualistic absolute Advaita of Ramana, but it is very much a part of the tantric Advaita that is like say, there are certain schools in India that are part of this tantric Advaita. One is Kashmir Shaivism, which is very close to Sri Aurobindo's conception. Another is the Kaula school. Another are the Kaula Siddha school schools. Kaula school is Srividya. Hmm? The, the, the Srividya, dedicated, dedicated to yeah. the Sri Chakra. Sri Chakra. The Kaula school is the school of the Sri Vidya or Sri Chakra. And this is precisely why 
When mother was doing her yoga of transformation, she called a tantric yogi called Pandaji to her and she meditated with her and during this period he transferred to her all this knowledge of the tantra of all these levels of reality because it was necessary for her work of transformation and in fact she said it was mentioned in a letter um, that was uh, sort of transmitted to Pandaji through Satprem. Mother says, in three months, I have done what would have otherwise taken me ten years of Sadam. So, this knowledge of these interconnections, interconnected levels of reality, Sri Binda also speaks about it. And uh, this knowledge is very necessary. So, so now, if you examine Sri Bindo's, what he evolved as his yoga, there are a lot of similarities with, uh, for example, in the Tantric Advaita, of the Kashmir Shaivism school, you have what are called the tattvas. They call them the evolutes of consciousness. And this is very similar to Sri Bindu's analysis of the different levels of reality. Now, <clears throat> the one thing that is new, somewhat new, in Sri Bindu's yoga is that in the psychic realization, he has emphasized the evolutionary element of the psychic being. And he has formulated on the basis of the traditional realizations the aspect of transformation. Now, this is not totally new because he said himself the Vedic Rishis knew about the supramental but they did not bring it down upon the earth. That was what is different, he said, in his yoga. Though there were partial attempts, like say, for example, in South India, in the Siddha tradition, particularly in Tamil Nadu, you had some very great yogis, like Ramaningam Swami. And Sri Bindu mentioned there is a yogi in South India who has achieved a higher level of physical transformation than I have. And I think evidently he was referring to Ramalingam Swami because the mother also mentioned, she said Ramalingam Swami's mantra Jyoti Arum Perun Jodi Perun Jodi Aru Perun Karane Aru Perun Jodi. Now, what does this mean? Mother said that this was an aspect of the supermental. She said it was the aspect of Ananda. Aru Perun Jyoti means there is the great light, vast light. Aru Perun Jyoti, Aru Perun Karune. There is the vast light of compassion, Karune. Now, Mother said that this was an aspect, is an aspect of the supermental. And it seems Ramalingam Swami had realized this. In fact, he had transformed his body to such an extent, it was emitting so much light, that is why he covered it with a white cloth. Because he said, unfortunately, people were attracted to him for the wrong reasons. <laughs> so he had, to, he had to hide himself. Yeah, we have all over Tamil Nadu <laughs> this little temple and his yeah. picture. He's a very famous saint here in Tamil Nadu. So, this Siddha tradition in South India 
particularly in Tamil Nadu, why do you think Sri Aurobindo came here? It's actually an atmosphere that is very compatible with his yoga. They said that tradition in Tamil Nadu. Because this tradition in India of, of, of the Tamil people is a very ancient, very ancient tradition with a very deep spiritual aspect. A lot of it has been lost now, but it is still there in the memory of the race, of, of, of the, uh, the people here. They were called the Tiruvalluvar. What is that? They were called the Tiruvalluvar Siddhayoji of South India, of which Ramalingan was also somehow coupled to. Tiruvalluvar. Okay. That's where the locality was. Tiruvallar. Yeah. Well, also, of course, you know, what Sri Bindu says is that Rishi Augustia came here. And maybe this is another reason. But, but the fact is, is that it is here in Pondicherry, in Tamil Nadu, that Sri Bindu had his basic realization that led to the real uh, beginning, commencement of his work. And that, was, that happened on November 24, 1926. And this was Sri Bindu's city day where he said, Krishna, it was the descent of the Krishna consciousness into the subtle physical. And this is what allowed him to begin his work of transformation and also his, the beginning of the ashram, which led, of course, also to the beginning of all of it. They're interconnected. And this is why Orville is so important. You know, I think we're coming. Orville is, has been past his 50th birthday, which is a miracle, because very few communities throughout the world that had been founded at the same time in the 60s have survived. Orville is one of the few, perhaps the only one, that has so really survived intact. And there is a reason why it has survived. Because Mother has installed here a force, which is the receptacle of the force is the Matamandir. I mean, there are so many things one can talk about in terms of the Matamandir and its relationship to the three transformations of Sri that Sri talks about. The crystal, for example, is the psyche. The crystal in the Matrimandi yes. chamber, that in is the, the main Matrimandi building chamber, in the center yes. of the city that Mother instructed yes. us to build yes. as, the, as she instructed in very precisely. Yes. And the sun, which uh, the rays of the sun descending and hitting the crystal, this, that represents the spiritual realization. And there is also implicit in the Matrimandiya what you call the supermental transformation. It is hidden in the chamber. And this third aspect, this is, you know, the Matamandir was built to help people within Orville or whoever who comes from outside also to help them realize the first two, the psychic and the spiritual. And that as a basis for the third to happen. Now, what is the third? Sri Bindu hints about it in his book, The Mother. <clears throat> he says there are four aspects of the mother. He says, however, there is a fifth aspect which he calls the Anandamai. Actually, 
in the Matsya Mandir, you have the first, the four aspects. Maheshwari, Mahakali, Mahalakshmi, and Mahasaraswati. So they are the four Aspect pillar of the, of the matrimandi structure. structure yes. that and they rep represent the four aspects of the Supreme Mother, of the Shakti. Now, these aspects of the Shakti are very much a part of the Tantric Advaita. And they serve certain functions, the four functions. But Sri Aurobindo says there is a fifth aspect, which he has not named. He simply says at the end of the mother, she is the Ananda Mai, who is the mother of transformation. So it is this aspect that the Matramanda represents, the Ananda Mai. And this is the secret also to, you know, if you talk about these realizations of the Supreme Brahman, of even the psyche. For most ordinary people, most of us, it's very difficult. Most people even don't know what you're talking about when you talk about the Supreme Brahman or the Supreme Self or the, the Divine in the heart because most have not experienced it. But Sri Bindo says, even so, there is an easier way in which, which is accessible to all human beings. And he says, humility in the heart. What is humility in the heart? It is to realize that physically we are only fragments very small things in the entirety of the universe that are egos. This is what he says is how you overcome ego because you cannot follow a spiritual path and you cannot do Sri Bindo's yoga of transformation until you overcome your ego. And how do you overcome your ego? The first way is through having these realizations of the Supreme Brahma and of the Divine in all things, automatically the ego starts to weaken, perhaps even disappear. But most human beings are not capable of that. So he says there is another way. You have humility in the heart. You realize that in relation to the universe, you are almost nothing. You're, you're a speck of dust. And realizing this, you open yourself. You know, there is a power in this universe, whether you call it the Supreme Brahman or the Mother or whatever, but it's easier with the Mother aspect because we are familiar with that. So we take the mother and we surrender. And we have a humility in the heart and allow her to lift us up. This is also an essential part of Sri Aurobindo's yoga, is that this humility in the heart leads to, if you're sincere about it, it leads to other experiences like you feel gratitude, gratitude for everything. Whatever happens, it happens because it is the will. It is this gratitude opens you also to other things like the grace, If you can open to the grace, it will lift you up. And you don't have to make, the only effort you have to make is receptivity, to be receptive and to be open and to allow the Shakti to lift you up. And this is the meaning 
of the Mata Mandir. And this is the meaning of why all of us are here in Orville. Because without this, we cannot be a community. There will only be egoistic mm. conflicts. There will only be, you know, one ego trying to impose itself on other egos. It will never work. So this process of humility in the heart, as Sri Aurobindo says, opening yourself to some of these other qualities of gratitude, of grace, will allow you, allow Orville as a community to become one and to evolve. And I think this is a, a kind of a, maybe even why a lot of the things that are happening now are happening, is to show us this. And even if it's a small group, uh, you know, not everyone, but at least some people, if they can do this, it will help. And it will be, it may take a long time for Orville to evolve to that point, but I have myself a very strong uh, certainty that it's going to happen. It may take 50 more years, it may take 100 more years, but it will happen. Mother said 200 years. <laughs> she said the real Orville will not manifest for 200 years. And I think that is a very conservative estimate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very funny, very funny. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting statement. Anyway, so, we better so, be ready for a long time uh, <laughs> projection. For a <laughs> yes. But if he had come, it will come any any time, even long time. He's very welcome as well. Well, you know, I've been an Orville from the beginning, more or less from uh, 50, <laughs> 54, 53 mm. years or so. And one has seen a lot. And the thing is, the very good thing about all these experiences is that what it shows is that a lot of these sort of conflicts we have as human beings are absolutely worthless. <laughs> they are nothing. But in fact, it's not, it is, our dedication of our will to the human unity does not mean that is there, mean that we have to achieve it through moment of difficulty, because you don't achieve something if you don't go through a test, and that's what our will is also. So the human unity is not achieved. We eat our tool to achieve that particular spiritual condition that allowed us to manifest this human unity. That is also very important. So all these moments for me are necessary as a test. We are like a big test field where our aspiration finally will be proof if we succeed in what is our spiritual aim, our aim of also collective living and collectivity. But I still believe in our will that is the best place to severally reach what we want to reach, because it doesn't give you many chance or many double face or many pocket. What you are, you are, and what you achieve, you achieve. So in this, I think we are very both very happy to be in Arovel, and we will continue to take the support of this big project of Mother to achieve what we want to achieve. Well, uh, what you say is true. It is, there's no doubt, Arovel is an excellent, excellent place to be if you want to change. Because if you don't change, you suffer. <laughs> <laughs> and we do suffer. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that is why the mother emphasized what she called the sunlit path. What is the sunlit path? Hmm. There was once a secretary of the mother, uh, her name was uh, Maggie Leachie. And someone asked her, what is the secret of your spiritual progress? And she said, 
I take everything, good or bad, as a grace from the mother. This is why what Sri said about humility in the heart, the sense of gratitude for everything, and the acceptance of the Supreme Grace is a very good way and the easiest way to progress. Because through this way, you can actually overcome to a large extent your egoistic personality. Because we're all born with this. It's a very heavy karma of all human beings. But you can deal with this through this method. It's actually a very easy method if you're sincere to follow it. And the whole problem with Orville at present is that people discuss these things all the time in meetings how to do this, how to do that, we should do this, we should do that. And no one gets to the essence of it. I think if people understood that there is a conscious power of the Shakti in Auraville, and if you open to it, it will guide you to do the right thing. I saw, this was my experience at Matamandir when I worked there. I could feel that there was a guidance. And it was a question of not letting your own ego get in the way. Let it work. Be as sincere as you can. Work hard. And it will work. Open yourself. If Orvillians can do this, it will, whatever we talk about human unity and about uh, the transformation, this will ha happen automatically. So we thank you very much for this wishful, okay. for this wishful words <laughs> that we <laughs> enjoy you. very much, full of hope and then, uh, for our progress. <laughs> we thank you very much for your input and we hope to have longer and uh, more from you. <laughs> okay.